No, chapter nine, we're just talking about short-term liabilities. Um, key terms I want us to make sure we know at the end is current and long-term liabilities, contingent liabilities, accrued liabilities, and estimated liabilities. But we're gonna be talking mainly about current liabilities. Uh, current liabilities and long-term, really whenever we say current versus long-term, uh, we've talked about this a few times in class now. So does anyone in the chat remember the difference between current and long-term? What makes something current versus long-term? All right, so no, that's, that's right. Current is one year or less. More technically, it's the operating cycle or less, but an operating cycle for a company is generally one year. So we, in this class, we can assume if a liability or anything is due, or we have it and can make it liquid within a year, then it's going to be current. If we owe it longer than a year, then it's going to be non-current or long-term. Good job. Other terms we're gonna be talking about are contingent liabilities. This means that we might owe money. I see, I see this a lot in my technical accounting profession, where uh, the most common of which is legal liabilities, where if a company sues, gets sued, they need, to know, they need to figure out, well, are we gonna win this lawsuit? Are we gonna lose this lawsuit? If we lose it, how much can we, are we potentially going to lose? And there's specific ways that we have to measure and disclose on the financial statements those li contingent liabilities. Uh, so that's, uh, that's contingent liabilities. Accrued liabilities, well, so in the chat, who can tell me uh, what is an accrued liability? We talked about this, I think, through the first four chapters. Yeah, payroll taxes are a good example of an accrued liability. It's good, good example. What's another example of an accrued liability? Yeah, P PTO is an accrued liability. Putnam gave an exact, uh, exact definition, which is good. Salary is, I think, the easiest example and expenses that have been incurred but not yet paid. So if we incurred a cost, but haven't paid it yet, it's going to be uh, it's going to be an accrued liability. That's correct. So all good example. PTO is a good example. Payroll taxes are all good examples. Uh, the key there is we accrue it if we owe it, but think accrued, we owe it, but we haven't paid it. We're going to then, then accrue it. If we paid it, we won't accrue it because we've incurred it already. Estimated liabilities. That's uh, this When we say estimated liabilities, we're talking about we don't know for certain how much we'll owe but we're estimating the, estimating the value. Uh, estimates are very, uh, very complex and one of the more difficult areas of accounting. I'm not going to ask you to make any estimates in your, in your homework. You won't be expected to do that for a very long time, but, uh, but you will have to be able to understand the ramifications of such estimates. So let's define liabilities. Current liabilities, we talked about this, right? Due within one year of the company's or the company's operating cycle, whatever is, whichever is longer. Just so you know, right, uh, this is a very unique. What they're saying here is some, some companies, like wineries are a great example, but some companies actually have longer than one year operating cycles. Operate, an operating cycle, from a, this is from a business perspective, is how long it takes you to uh, go from quote to cash. So how long it takes you to develop a product, grow it, and then, or, or develop it, and then, uh, purchase the raw materials, develop it, and then sell it, and then receive cash for it. Um, so some companies, the most common example I think is a winery, right, where you have to plant grapes, grow the grapes, then ferment the wine. Uh, sometimes it could take 10 years. And so current liabilities for those companies can be uh, uh, anything within the, that 10-year cycle, uh, depending on their operating cycle. But for most of the companies you're going to work with, unless you're in agriculture or in research and development, current is going to be within one year. And so make that assumption going forward. That's just so you understand when they talk about an operating cycle. Long-term liabilities are due one year or later, which is ever is longer or later of the operating cycle. Okay, so what classifying liabilities, we should know, there's some liabilities we know about. We know who to pay, how much to pay, and when to pay them. Some liabilities we don't know who to pay and we don't know how much to pay or when to pay it, right? So first, we're going to just talk about known liabilities. Um, 
known current liabilities, we I think the class did a good job of saying accounts payable, sales tax payable, unearned revenues, deferred revenue as a current liability, short-term notes payable, payroll liabilities, and multi-period known liabilities. So an example of accounts payable, what's an accounts payable class? Someone put in the chat, what's an accounts payable? What makes it unique? Accounts payable is money we owe, right? But it's money we owe to vendors generally. So it's a specific classification of money that we owe to vendors that we have not paid yet. No, so it's a current liability generally, as long as we owe that money within the next year or the, the greater of the operating cycle. Sales taxes, we've talked about that. Sales taxes, how, how do we count for those? Those are when the state says there's a 10% tax on everything you purchase uh, other than food. The company will collect those sales taxes and then remit it or, or give it to the state on a quarterly basis or, or whenever the state uh, is deemed to collect it. So that's a liability to the government. Unearned revenue, that's deferred revenue, right? And so if I collect money for a service in advance that I haven't performed, I'll defer that revenue. It's known as a, as long as that revenue is going to be performed, uh, that service is going to be performed in the next year, uh, I'll generally consider that a, uh, a, defer, a deferred revenue and that's a current liability because I owe the service to another company or I owe the service to another person. Short-term notes payable, that's if I owe a debt to the bank and I'm going to pay that within the next year. I'll say the next year, just know about the operating cycle in the background, if the operating cycle is greater, I mean the, the greater of. Um, and then pay, payroll liabilities, that's if I pay on every other week and at the end of the month I owe certain amount of money to my employees, I'll accrue for that. And then multi-period known liabilities, that might be, uh, uh, we'll go into more detail there in other classes. I really wanna focus, and on this exam, we'll be focusing on the sales tax payable, unearned revenue, short-term notes payable, and payroll liability. So sales tax payable. This is a journal entry, we'll just go through it so you have it for your records. On August 31st, Home Depot sold materials for $6,000 that are subject to a 5% tax. So we're just adding one layer to the journal entry, right? So we know that originally, without the sales tax, well, we would just have a debit cash of $6,000 and credit sales of $6,000. This is not looking at the cost of goods sold side of the portion of the journal entry. So we just debit cash, $6,000, credit sales, $6,000. But now we also have to add in our sales tax. So to calculate the sales tax, we take the 5%, multiply it by the sales price, and then we would have the $300 as the sales tax payable. So relatively simple calculation. Uh, and then we would have the 6,300 as the cash, 6,000 in sales, and then 300 as sales tax payable. So simple calculation, if we're receiving cash for sales tax, and we're saving it for the government, we have to have it as a liability. So here, what's the journal entry? Same, same kind of consideration, right? We have our 7,500 in cash, we add in the tax, and then the, uh, the difference is going to be our sales tax payable. So 7,500 times 6% is 450. We add the 450 to the 7,500 to get how much cash we received. Relatively simple journal entries. This, right, cash is an asset, debit balance, sales is revenue, credit balance, sales tax payable is an accrued liability or liability, current liability. So it's going to be a credit normal balance. So that's going to increase the account. Unearned revenues. So again, this is why I, I mentioned if you did well in the first midterm or you worked hard on it, you are going, to, it's going to be easier going forward. And then if you didn't do well in the first midterm, it's, you had kind of get to redeem yourself because this is exactly what we've talked about in previous, uh, previous classes, right? Unearned revenue, nothing new here. If we sell tickets for $5 million uh, in advance, we get cash for 5 million, uh, credit unearned revenue for 5 million. And then uh, as we perform a concert or as we perform the service, we'll recognize that revenue. 
we can recognize that services can be by uh, completion of the service, they can be by hours, they can be by days. It really depends on the service. This example is using concerts, right? So eight concerts, $5 million cash. So every concert she makes, uh, she earns the 625,000. So on day one, we debit cash, credit unearned revenue. And then uh, when we perform the service, we debit unearned revenue and credit revenue. Unearned revenue being the liability, cash being an asset, and then revenue being on the income statement. So hopefully not too difficult. The one trick here, right, is if we were going to perform these concerts greater than a year away, there would be a portion of this that would be short term and a portion that would be long term, the portion of long term, which would be uh, the one that we're going to perform after a year. But assume if we don't say it's within a year or not, uh, assume that it's within a year, we'll, we'll consider it current. And then short term notes payable. This is a promise just to pay a specific amount soon. Uh, generally, you can think of a loan. The easiest way to think this is a short-term loan within the next year. Uh, again, company's operating cycle. Note that. So it could be a note to extend payment of an accounts payable or a loan. Generally, we'll see it as a loan. This is what it would look like on paper from a bank, or you'd get an email, something similar. The way you would read this is $2,000 loan. Uh, we got to pay it back. We, we received the loan on September 30th, 2015. Uh, we owe this in 60 days after September 30th, and we're going to pay $2,000 at an annual interest rate of 12%. And so you're going to have to learn how to, to do the interest on this, but we've already done that, right? So we've done that in our first few chapters, so not too difficult, uh, just a, a calculation, and you have to be careful with the dates. So on August 23rd, we'll go through one example here. August 23rd, we have Ask McGraw to accept $100 cash on a 60-day 12% $500 note to replace its existing $600 accounts payable. So what we're saying is, hey, I can't pay you today. Instead, I can pay you $100 today. I can't pay you the $600 today, but I can pay you $100, and I'll pay you the rest, the remaining $500 in 60 days at 12% interest. So how do we calculate this? I think that's just open up our trusty calculator, right? So we know first we collected, we have our accounts payable. We no longer have an accounts payable because we renegotiated the deal. We paid a hundred bucks, right? So cash is a hundred. That's easy. We know if we paid it, it's credited, right? Cash is credited. So that's an easy journal entry. We know that we no longer have accounts payable. And so that difference is going to be our notes payable. This is on August 23rd, the original date of the entry. Afterwards, we have to determine how much interest we're going to owe. Uh, on the day that we pay the note. So we know that there's a 12% interest rate. So we're going to owe $60 that goes for an entire year. Interest is always at an annual rate. So we would owe $60 interest plus the $500 remaining. But we're only doing it for six months, right? I mean, two months here, 60 days. So we divide this by 12 times two. We're going to owe $10 of interest plus the $500, 510. So if we would once we pay it, we would debit our notes payable 500, debit our interest expense 10, and credit our cash 510. So only trick here is if this happened at the end of a fiscal period or at the end of a year, we would then have to accrue the interest expense because we'd owe it, but we haven't paid it yet. If that was the case, we would have we wouldn't have this notes payable McGraw. We would just have debit interest expense credit accrued interest. Notes given to borrow from the bank. So this is next step if we're not exchanging it for accounts payable. So in this thing, we're just taking money from the bank, right? We're borrowing money from the bank. Again, known as a note, we can also call it a loan. A company borrows $2,000 of bank at 12% interest. So we'd owe 240 interest if we borrowed it for the year. At cash and notes payable on the first day we're going we receive what we receive cash cash is an asset with a debit balance so we're going to debit the cash and then we're going to credit the notes payable which is the liability to say we owe it for owe it to the bank then when we repay it we're going to calculate the interest that we repaid similar to the previous entry so we know that two thousand dollars times twelve percent is two hundred forty dollars for the year 
then we owe it in 60 days, so divide by 12 times two for two months, and you have $40 here. I'm doing it by months, this does it by days, either works. Um, so then when we pay it, we debit our notes payable, credit our cash for the 2040, and debit our interest expense. So we reduce the liability, reduce our asset, and then increase our interest expense. We've done this before, but now it's just in more detail, right? When a note expends, extends over a period end, we need to uh, accrue for the interest expense, like we discussed. So here's the example here. Company borrows $5,000 from the bank at 12% interest. Point 12 for 60 days. We know the 12% interest is an annual interest, so we divide it by 12. Right, so that's 50 bucks. On December 16th, we borrow it. What is the adjusting entry needed on December 31st? So they're doing this monthly, and so they're saying, well, we owe $25. I don't like this example a lot. It'd be easier if you think about it as December 1st, but a lot of companies will use this monthly convention as days will be too complex. So they're saying we owe about a month of interest. So uh, calculate one month of interest. We just went through the calculation. It's 25. We owe it but haven't paid it yet. So we have a debit interest expense of 25, credit interest payable of 25. What is entry to record the repayment of the note in February 14th? Now the only trick here is uh, the repayment of the note on February 14th is we know that we had the 5,000 bucks times a 12% interest, we know at the end of the day, we owed $100 in interest expense. That was the 12 months divided by two. Uh, interest payable, we had the 25. Interest expense, we had 75. I'm oh, sorry, let me go back and recalculate this. I see what they did here. I, I mistakenly miscalculated this one. So 5,000 times 12% divided by 12. 50, and then here they're using a half month convention. So they're saying, uh, or, or even a day convention. So what they're saying is they owed, they have 15 days left on this. You can use a monthly convention as well, but um, I'm using a daily convention here. I'll, I'll show you the daily convention. So the 5,000 times a 12% interest divided by 360 days. We're saying 360 days in a year. And we said there's 15 days in this year. So 15 days. Gets us to December 31st, we say we, we accrued about $25 in interest expense. Well, now here, we know that totally we owed times 12 divided by 360 times 60. We owed 100, right? We owed two months of interest as of February 14th, but we've already accrued 25 of it. So we have to subtract out the 25. We expense the other 75. And then our total interest is our cash, uh, cash amount. And again, that's the 5,000 times 0.12 uh, by two months, right? 5,000, we calculated uh, 5,000 times 0.12 divided by 12 times two, plus the original 5,000. We get our 5,100, which is our cash out. We remove our interest payable. We add the interest expense remaining, and then the, we remove the notes payable from the book. So there's multiple, way, multiple ways to calculate this. I always think the easiest way is always figure out your first entry. See if it's asking for a day convention or a monthly convention. And then, uh, and then figure out for your subsequent entry, figure out your credit to cash, always the easiest entry, how much are we paying? Remove your original interest payable, remove the notes payable, and your difference is your interest expense. You can also recalculate your interest expense, but either way, the entry has to balance, and this might be quicker if you back into it by going cash, removing the notes payable, removing the interest payable, and your difference is your interest expense. Okay, so in this example, we ask Carter Code to accept a 90-day 12% note to replace its existing $5,000 accounts payable. We'll just go through this example. Again, this is a case where uh, your customer can't pay 
within the day that they originally promised. So we're going to extend it by offering exchanging their accounts payable for a note. So it's, upon the exchange, we always reduce our accounts payable and change it to a note payable because we're no longer uh, paying, we're no longer accepting it from a, uh, we're paying to a vendor where we're exchanging it now and making it a note. We're saying, hey, we can't, we can't pay you today. We'll pay you in the future. So now we're kind of borrowing money from our vendor. Uh, in this case, we pay interest on the note. Uh, we pay the note plus the interest as we go. So very similar to a loan, right? Notes payable. Here they said 5,000 times the 12% interest we talked about. Uh, here it's 90 days times 90 divided by 360. That's 150 in interest and then we'll pay it off. But again, this is just if we're low on cash, we might renegotiate with our vendor to pay them interest. How many days must he accrue? So we're gonna use a 360 day convention. Uh, some companies use 365 day conventions. It really just depends on the company. Um, and so we're saying here, James brought $8,000 on December 16th. How, for how many days must he accrue? All you have to do is 31 minus 16. You get your 15 days that you have to accrue for. Well, what is the entry to record it? So 15 days here and then 45 days here, right? We just have to count the number of days in between. What is the entry to record the note and the entry to accrue the interest on 1231? Same as before, we've gone through these entries, so I don't wanna uh, beat them over uh, too much, but cash, we'll receive cash, we credit our notes payable, and then we'll debit interest expense, credit interest payable based on our calculation here. What well, entry would we make on the due date of the note? On the due date, we pay out the notes payable, pay out the interest payable, adjust for interest expense, credit cash. So all of these are just examples of what we've gone over in the last few slides. So hopefully not too overwhelming. Um, all we're doing is trying to figure out the time that we took the loan and the interest expense for the period. Okay, so any questions? This is really your notes payable, current notes payable, your current accounts payable, um, and then adding interest into it if we have interest. It's the first major part of current liability. Any questions here? Cool. Hopefully it's straightforward. Yeah, I'd, I'd say anything on the slides is fair game for your exam. Right, either in a multiple choice question or in recalculating. Any questions to know? But yeah, I would make sure you know how to do all of these journal entries. And we'll go over the midterm next as an export portion of the presentation. I'd recommend practice your homework. Your homework is going to be the best indicator of what your midterm will be like. Except the midterm will also have multiple choice, which I don't believe is on your own work. Okay, I'm gonna take silence from everyone as uh, chug, a, chug along, let's keep going. So we talked about, remember the way that this is structured, we'll go back to slide 35 in a second. We talked about the different liabilities here, we talked about accounts payable, now we're gonna go to sales tax payable. We talked about sales and tax payable. We talked about unearned. We talked about short-term notes payable. Almost through the chapter, right? Now we're just talking about payroll liabilities. Employees have amounts withheld from their paychecks based on their earnings, right? Employees incur expenses and liabilities for having employers have expenses for incurring employees. So what are some examples of that? Do you, any of you have know of what kind of costs we may incur for having employees? If you were to hire someone, what, what would you owe in addition to their salary? For our 1K contributions, that's a good one. Yep, true. What other costs might we have? Mm -hmm. Insurance. Anyone else? Anyone other than Snow? Yeah, we might. We have to 
recruit for bonuses. That's good. Yep, yeah, unemployment. That's the big one. That's what I want to get at. There's actually a lot of in, intrinsic costs in uh, in hiring an employee above and beyond just the salary, salary, right? So we have PTO, we have 401k contributions, we have health insurance, we have something called FICA taxes. That's a uh, FICA is social security and Medicare taxes. And then we also have unemployment and disability taxes that employers pay for. There's an employer portion and an employee portion. Changes, but it's been relatively consistent, right? And then you can always just look up FICA taxes. How much? So employee and employer split the tax for both of them. Current social security and Medicare tax rates are 6.2% and 1.45% respectively. So remember, whenever your employer is paying your salary, they're also paying an additional, uh, what is that? 6.2 plus 1.45. 7.65% of your entire salary is being paid by your employer um, to to your FICA contribution. And that's gonna to go to your Medicare when you're older and as, as well as your social security payments, uh, which is kind of a government pension fund too for everybody. So 7.65% of all of that is included in your employer's payroll tax. Not only do we have that, but we also have the PTO, the healthcare. And so if you really look at it, if someone's making $100,000 a year, if you just add the one, Add the uh, two times one point, this approximately seven percent. We already the employer already owes an additional seven thousand just as taxes to that employer employee, and then they also might owe, owe PTO and bonuses and everything you mentioned. So having employees can get quite expensive. Uh, employers must remit this or pay it uh, to the Internal Revenue Service. So we're they're collecting on an ongoing basis, and then we'll pay it to I, the IRS. There's also state and local income taxes. And so when, when you get your paycheck, you'll get remittance for uh, your state and local taxes too, um, which the government has to hold for. And California has notoriously high tax, employee tax. And there might be voluntary deductions as well, right? Including union dues, savings accounts, pension contributions, premiums, charities. Uh, and then the employer needs to hold this and then remit them or pay them to the, uh, to the employees designated agencies. So payroll is an entire area of an accounting and you can just be a payroll specialist and have a quite a decent career in accounting. So I would expect that we do have something like, you need to do, know how to do these entries for your exam as well, right? Anything on this is fair game. Um, but you'll have the fact pattern here. This is just an example journal entry and then the details are here. But salary expense might be we might only owe $1,524, but we will have FICA, Medicare taxes, income tax payable, insurance payable, union dues payable, and then you have your salaries. So the salary expense might be $2,000, even though we only are paying the employee $1,524. And we're, the company will hold all of these and pay the union separately, the Medicare, medical insurance separately, federal income tax separately, They'll withhold all these amounts in a liability as a liability. So this is where we get that shrinking paycheck. So if you ever, uh, for those of you who haven't gone into the job market yet, when you do get into the job market, you might get paid a thousand dollars a week, and you'll find out you're actually getting six hundred dollars a week, and that's because of all of these deductions. Uh, work or payroll expense deductions are not taken as for employees' record. Let's see. So this is the way the journal entry would like uh, look like, is we debit salaries expense, credit our FICA, credit our employee income tax, credit the medical insurance, credit the state tax payable, credit salaries payable. And then if there's charity, we might add charity in it as well. And the net pay would be the 619. So total pay is 1000, but the net pay is actually gonna be 619. So this is for employees. This is related strictly to the employees. Then we have the employer portion of these taxes, which includes that other half of the FICA and Medicare taxes, as well as unemployment taxes as well. 
there's a federal unemployment tax, 6% on the first $7,000 of wages you pay to your employee. Uh, you don't need to know these exact numbers. They'll be given to you. This is just for your reference. And then state unemployment tax, uh, which is even higher. Tax is its own issue and tax laws uh, can get rather complex and you'll eventually study tax laws and tax accounting if you pursue your accounting education further. But just know that these exist and how to, how to do the general accounting. So you'll get these numbers or you'll get the percentages in your questions and you'll just have to do the journal entries and understand where it came from. So an entry to record the employer payroll taxes for January, we might have payroll, we'll have a payroll tax expense and then we'll have all of these liabilities that we'll then pay to um, pay to these agencies. So this is on top, right? So there's two sides. This is the employee payroll deductions. So the salary expense is 1,000. This person was being paid monthly, that would be a $12,000 a year salary. And then at the end, they're getting the 619. But then on top of that, we have the employer taxes, including the other half of the Social Security and Medicare, the FICA taxes, our state unemployment tax, and our federal unemployment tax. Uh, so this includes, uh, this would be calculated for these percentages, the 108 and the 12, and then FICA amounts are the same as uh, the from the employees gross pay. Employers, employees and employers are gonna be the same. They're just asking how much does your, in addition, do they have to pay? So if you're wondering how come our payroll taxes, so uh, why your pay might be so low, it's because we're owing 165.50 on top of the 2,000 over here, or the 1,000 over here. I think they, the only thing I don't like about this example is they changed the 1,000 to 2,000 dollars, so, but, Otherwise, I hope it was under, understandable that there's, what you need to know is there's two sides of it, employee and employer, and what's in those two sides. Employee, right? Employee has our FICA taxes, which is Social Security and Medicare, federal income tax, medic, medical insurance, state tax payable, maybe charity, and, salary, and then we get our final salaries payable. So I could see a question where I ask you, what's the net salaries payable? or what's the journal entry for salaries payable, and we give you all of these facts. Or I can say, what from an employer, how much, what's the employer portion of the payroll tax? Well, you'd have to know it's half of the FICA, the state unemployment tax, and the federal unemployment tax. So just practice your problems, your homework, and look at these examples to make sure you memorize all, all these uh, moving pieces. Again, entry is not too complex once you have the numbers. It's always going to be debit payroll tax expense and credit or liability. Each one of these is going to be its own liability. And then when the, when the employer pays it, they're going to debit the liability and credit cash. Generally quarterly. Generally companies pay their taxes quarterly, if anyone's wondering. So here's an example. Yeah, no, no need to memorize tax rates. They change all of the time. Tax law is very complex. You can make an entire career out of tax accounting. You can make, I, I have friends who have very lucrative lives and their entire focus is on a small business payroll tax, just remitting payroll taxes and filing their year, year end taxes just for small businesses. So it can be rather complex and is always changing. Uh, a very interesting subject if you ever want to learn more about it, but it's, it's really more of an economics government focused topic than you, you can imagine rather than just being taxes. You, you might hear about it in the current news, right, where they're considering uh, reducing the tax on meals and entertainment to revitalize the restaurant industry after all this is over. So tax law is used as an incentive a lot of the time for industries. Uh, so definitely an interesting economic impact if you ever do study it. Um, BX, so let's go through this example. BMX company has one employee. FICA security taxes are 6.2% of the first 118,500 paid to its employer employee, and the FICA and Medicare taxes are 1.45%. So BMX, its SUDA taxes um, are 0.6%, and SUDA are 2.9% of the first 7,000 paid. Compute the amount for each of the above four taxes as applied by the employee's gross earnings. And then we just calculate it here. September earnings subject to tax. Uh, let's see, gross payment through August, gross payment through September, gross payment through, gross 
pay for December, goes pay through December. And then the question is, how do we calculate it? And what we're going to do is we have, we have to be very careful. What's the employee's September 30th journal entry? And so the trick here, right, and what uh, everyone here has to be uh, has to work on as accountants is what is the question asking us? And we're always going to get more problems than uh, more information than we need, right? And the reason that they do this, it's not to be mean and to trick you. It's because that's what the career is like. Uh, every day I get a lot of information and I have to determine what is necessary to solve the problem I'm given. Right, so this is going to be, these kind of problems are very good for preparing you for what the real world is like. So prepare the employer's September 30th journal entry. Well, we don't need to know the amount for August then or the total gross pay for this question. We just need to know what's the gross pay for September. We just need to know the September 30th entry. So to know that, we know we paid $800 and we were given all of these tax rates. So $800 here multiplied by the 6.2% is 4960. They have these caps, right? They say of the first 118,000 paid, well, we know we didn't even reach that. So we're okay. So 800, 800, we're okay here. 1.45% times 1160, 49. Uh, 800 times 6.2% is 49.60. 800 times 1.45% is 1160. Then this drops to 600. And so we might ask, why, why? I thought we got paid 800. Well, we know that these taxes are only paid of the first $7,000 paid to the employee. And so 6,400 plus 800, we get our 7,200, right? And so out of reality, we have to subtract 200 of it because that extra $200 here isn't going to be isn't going to be subject to these taxes. So then we take the 600 times the 0.6%, the 600 times the 2.9%, and we get our entries for SUDA and, FUDA and SUDA. And so we have to be careful on what entry are we booking. We're booking the September entry on this amount. Then we have to be careful, did we hit our caps? If we go over we for the year, we don't have to pay taxes. And that's where we get this example. So this is a very good example of something that you should practice and understand. Then we book these entries. Salaries expenses 800. We know we have these taxes for our, our employee, uh, 4960, 1160, and then food and SUDA. We just added uh, employee federal income tax payable. Let's see where they got that. Salaries payable. 60 plus 11.60 plus 360 plus 1740, 82. Federal income tax payable. Oh, this is coming from here, right? The federal income tax payable is $80, which we put here. This is our difference. Um, this is for our employee, right? We know that the salaries expense is coming from the employee's paycheck. These last two pieces come from the employer's pay, uh, pay. So we always have to differentiate that too. So here, employee, employee, employee. We have to flag this, we know this is for employer. employer. Employee, right? The employee entries gets booked on their payroll. So debit salaries expense for the 800, that's their pay for the period. And we also withheld $80 for their federal income tax expense. We also had to withhold for their FICA and Medicare and Social Security, and that's going to be their salaries payable. This will be the net pay they get in their paycheck. And these two pieces will be on the employer's uh, employer liability. Let's see, student tax payable. Prepare this to record the employer's payroll. We have to remember now for employer, all of these are for the employer. And so the trick here, 
you might ask, you might ask is, why do, is this employee and employer? It's because that's just the way the law is, right? The law is that the tax is really twice this, half of it comes from the employee and half of it comes from the employer. And so taxes are 6.25% on the employee. And it, we know that FICA and, uh, and Medicare also are from employer. So both, both sides of the transaction. So I could ask you, what's the journal entry for the employee? This would be the journal entry for the employee. I could ask you, what's the journal entry for the employer? This would be the journal entry from the employer. What's the difference? Journal entry for the employee also has this federal income tax withholdings. And if I added something like uh, charitable contributions or union dues, it would also be deducted from the employee's, uh, employee's problem or, or employee's pay. But from the employer perspective, uh, if I, it's always going to be these FICA, these Medicare taxes, and then we have FUDA and SUDA. So just be careful to differentiate what's the difference between the employee and the employer taxes. Go through these problems and go through your homework and book. And also just make sure to in your books, there's certain ratios that we have to be aware of, right? I tested on ratios last time. I'll test on ratios again as part of your learning objectives. So make sure you memorize all those ratios in your book as well. Okay, so we're talking about the cap here, the 600. What we're saying here is the 7,000, there's a cap on these taxes, 7,000, right? But maybe on the employer side, it'll be easier to see. There's a cap for BMX, its taxes are on the first $7,000 paid to employees. But we paid $7,200. So our cap, we were capped at 7,000. So our pay through August was 6,400. And then to get to the 7,200, 7, we have to subtract it to 7,000. We really shouldn't be subtracting from 7,200. We should be subtracting from the 7,000. As it's the 7,000 is the cap. So it's really 7,000 minus the 6,400. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, we don't pay any taxes after the 7,000 for these two taxes, Buddha and Suda. Correct. Okay, this last piece, we're gonna go as estimated liabilities, contingent liabilities. And then we'll take a break and then we'll go over the midterm. We'll go over a comprehensive review of everything we've gotten so far for this chapter, for the last few chapters. Okay, estimated liabilities. So what's an estimated liability? It's a known obligation that we aren't certain of the amount and we have to reasonably estimate it. We, it has to be reasonably estimate, estimatable. So that includes vacation benefits, warrant, warranty liabilities. We talked about PTO, right? Vacation benefits. Let's say we have each employee in a company earns vacation at the rate of one day per month. So they get 12 days a, a year. During June, 12 employees qualify for one day of vacation each. Their average wage rate is $100 per day. What is the amount of vacation benefit expense for the month of June? And so this is an estimate, right? We don't actually know how much vacation expense we'll have, but we're just going to have to estimate it because we, we can't tell our employees when to take their vacation. So we're just gonna take the 20 employees times 100 days, $100 a day, um, times one vacation day earned every month. So we're gonna say it's about $2,000 a month. That's all we can do. We don't know how much they're actually gonna take, but we know that it's worth about $100 a day times the $10 time is the one uh 20 employees and the one day a month and so then we debit our vacation expense for the month 
that PTO has paid for its own time off. Uh, 20 employees times the $1,000, $100 a day times the one day of vacation. We get the debit vacation benefit expense of 2,000, and then we'd have payable of 2,000. This is an accrued liability that we estimate, right? We don't know, maybe these people won't take their vacation. Some people don't take their vacation. Some people take too much vacation, which you don't really have a right to. Um, some people will quit before they take their vacation. But at the end of the day, well, we'll accrue for this benefit because this is the best estimate we can make. Uh, this is generally going to be, that's a great question. Is this a current or long-term liability? It depends on the company's policy, right? If a company has a policy of you use it or lose it, um, some companies say you have 12 days of PTO a year, and if you don't use it, it doesn't accrue past that, then it would be current. If we have a policy of you can accrue it up to 50 days, we'd have to estimate how much is long-term and how much is short-term, or how much is current. Um, you don't have to worry about that as to, as splitting the current from long-term yet, but eventually, I always want you thinking of this uh, as if it's current or long-term. It's a great question. Another example is a warranty liability. Oh, good Good question. What is the entry made? We'd make this normally at the end of the, every month. It'd be part of our month close procedure if we don't have a month close. If we're doing quarterly financial statements, it'd be at the end of every quarter. We only accrue expenses after we've incurred them, right? So uh, that, that's a good question. We wouldn't say, oh, we know we're going to accrue this over the next year, so let's accrue it today. That wouldn't be appropriate. We only accrue it once we owe it. So this would be at the end of the month. Good question. Warranty liabilities, sometimes, this is pretty common in contracts. Um, a lot of my job is I review customer contracts for complex transactions. And uh, it's very common for large deals for there to be some kind of warranty where the, and this is for all industries, right? Where the seller says, if something goes wrong with this product, we'll replace it or we'll give you a refund for the next 90 days to a year, sometimes two years. Um, if there's an expected expense related to those warranties, we need to match it to the revenue we made and we need to estimate a liability for that warranty. And so we'll have this estimated warranty expense based on our estimate. So a good example is cars. A lot of people will buy warranties with their cars. A lot of cars come with warranties. So if we sell a car for 16,000 with a maximum of one year, 12,000 mile warranty, past experience indicates that it costs about 4% to pay for this warranty. So we would calculate this as accountants. We might calculate this number, but you won't have to on your exams. You'll get the indicated average. So the question is, how do we determine how much we owe, uh, how much we might owe, and that, what, how do we estimate the warranty liability? Let's take that $16,000 and multiply it by 0 0.04, there's 640 warranty expense. That's it. We'll expense it once we sell the car and we'll estimate the warranty liability here. And then if a customer claims part of that warranty, we'll re just reduce that warranty reserve. Estimate the warranty, we'll, so we we gave them some product based on the warranty, $200, we'll just debit the estimated warranty and credit that. The, inventory we have. So not too difficult here. It's just you'll get the estimate and you'll have to figure out on day one, on the day of the sale is when we do the expense. The expense is always going to be the, the amount of the sale times the estimate. And then, uh, then as we use the warranty, then we will reduce the warranty and remove it from inventory. Let me look at this example. So again, right, I want to I want us all to practice. This is how I do exams, and I would recommend doing the same. First, read the questions. Don't read, this is a big fact pattern, right? So questions, how much warranty expense does a company report in 2017? So we need to figure out warranty expense. We have to figure out the warranty liability. How much warranty expense does a company report in 2018? So, okay, we have the subsequent year. So we need to know two years of reporting. And what's the estimated liability? So the first question is, what's the warranty expense? Well, what do I need to know for that? I need to know the cost of the copier, what my sale was, and the estimated warranty cost, right? So I can read through this quickly. 
the property was costing 4,800 and we sold it for on August 16th for $6,000 cash. Well, I don't care about the cost of goods sold. I care about the sale. because so my warranty is gonna be estimated off the sale. Uh, so then I need to know, I know the calculation, right? It's the amount of the sale multiplied by our estimate. So then I could scan through this very quickly and say, oh, here's an a for, estimate. A percentage looks like an estimate, so let me read the sentence. These are the only repairs required in 2018. Don't really care about that yet. Based on experience, we expect to incur a warranty cost of 4% of dollar sales. So I'll just do the 6,000 times 1, 0, 4, 240. So I expect a warranty expense of 240. So on day one, I book, this is our answer number one, right? So instead of having to read through all this and figure out all, all these entries, I already know the answer to number one. 4% of 6,000 is 240 in 2017. What's the estimated warranty liability in 2017? Well, we know it's gonna be a debit warranty expense of 240 and credit warranty liability of 240. It's not a question, but then the question is, uh, how much have we incurred in 2017? So I'll read through the question again to find that next answer. The repairs on November 22nd, 2018, we spent 209 on repairs. These are the only repairs required in 2018. Okay, and so we, we know that incurred in 2018. So we had no expenses in 2017. So we'll just have this liability as of 2017, the 240, because we didn't incur any expenses related to the warranty. Well, and then, so the next question is, is there any warranty expense in 2018? Well, no, we, we estimate it based on the sale. So we don't need any warranty expense in 2018. Uh, and then how much is the estimated warranty for the copier? This will be right here. The estimated warranty remaining would just be the 240 minus the 209 we found in the next question. So 31, we spent 209 on it, we'll reduce our liability. Any questions? I, I recommend everyone should always go through problems that way. First, read the problem, figure out the facts you need, and then you'll be able to solve it a little quicker. Okay, last piece before lunch break or coffee break, whatever you're having, accounting for contingent liabilities. You just have to memorize this chart. That's it. Uh, the concept here, Think about legal liabilities, I think are the easiest to think about. They can get a lot more complex in accounting when you get into financial instruments, but you don't have to worry about that yet. Um, so just think about a legal liability. What if I got sued? That's a contingent event. I don't know if I get sued if I'm gonna actually owe money or not, right? And so first we'd ask our lawyers like, okay, if we get sued, are we gonna owe money? And the lawyers might say, no, there's a remote chance. You're not gonna owe any money. I mean, I'll get right back to that. So we might say the future event is remote. Remote meaning there's a very low chance. There's actually a percentage chance. Our attorneys will tell us it's not gonna happen. So we don't need to say anything about it. If it's not gonna happen, even if we're getting sued, the investors won't care. Uh, and we'd get a letter from our lawyers and then auditors will also request that same letter from the lawyers. Contingent liability, if it's possible. So if, if it's greater than remote, but lower than probable. So we're talking like 70% or less range. If it's possible, we'll tell the investors, we'll have a note that says, hey, just so you know, we're undergoing this lawsuit. Um, we think it's possible we might owe money, but it's not probable. And then finally, if our lawyers say, hey, just so you know, we're probably gonna owe money for this lawsuit, we did something wrong. The next question is we ask them, okay, how much are we going to owe? If we can't estimate it, we'll just disclose it. If we can estimate it, we're gonna record, record a liability. That's a good question, so now, uh, generally we are relatively conservative when we're recording liabilities, but there's specific guidelines uh, in the guidance that defines what probable means, possible and remote, and what's estimatable. So as long as you're following those guidelines, you're generally, uh, you're generally going to be safe. But you don't need to know those guidelines for this class. But like if uh, if someone if a lawyer said yeah there's a 69.999% chance that you're gonna get oh money 
I could, we might just decide to say, okay, it's probable, right? And then back to your question, Hemi. So, oh, so sorry, class. So make, make sure you just memorize this. I can ask you, the question is, when will we record a liability for contingent liability? When will we accrue a liability for contingent liability? And you'd have to tell me when the future event is probable and the amount um, owed is estimable. Or I say, what if, when do we not disclose for it? And you'd say when the contingent liability is remote. And for HEMI, repair parts 29 will be recorded as inventory to JE. Uh, no, it's a reduction to inventory in the JE. So we debit expense credit our inventory. Or for here, this is repairs for materials. Yeah, so we take in repair, repair parts. So we debit our accrued liability, accrued warranty liability, and then we credit our inventory or our supplies, either or. Okay, any question on this material before we take a break? No problem, any. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording then. Uh, this was for chapter nine, and then we'll get back at 10.30, when we'll go over a comprehensive review of the midterm. Okay, wait, quick question. So there is no principle of conservatism, just so everyone knows. In accounting, there's no such thing as a conservative principle. Uh, so don't get that in your heads. Generally, you have, just have to follow the guidance, right? And so you might see in practice, some people are more conservative, but that's not the principle in accounting. So uh, we really have to go off the evidence. So this would be estimated by our attorneys. Some companies might try to be more conservative, but in, in reality, there's no such thing as a principle of cons conservation, uh, conservatism. We just have to accurately represent the transactions that are occurring. What I'm saying is, if we're pretty sure this is going to occur, it would be wrong to say it's possible. If we're probable, it's wrong to say it's possible. We aren't gonna to try to be aggressive with this. We need to accurately depict this. And some people might see that as conservative, but there's no such thing as a principle of conservatism. And so to clear, clearly identify this, what, what I mean is we actually would go to a lawyer and I, I forget the exact terms, but I think probable is over 70 or 80%, possible is over 20% and remote's less than 20%. There's some kind of exact range. And we'd ask our attorneys based on your previous cases, what's our percent chance of winning this thing or losing it? And they'd give us an exact percentage or put it in one of these buckets and then we would disclose it accordingly. So it wouldn't be an area of accounting judgment, it would be a legal, legal question. Any other questions? I want to make sure that's clear that there's no principle of conservatism because the, the FASB actually keeps reading guidance that's very clear that we aren't trying to be conservative. We're just trying to accurately depict what's, what's occurring, how the transactions are occurring. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I will stop the recording now. Let's say 15 minute break. So let's say 1035. We'll start back up. Thank you. Feel free to write questions in the meantime, and I'll try to address them when I get back. Let's see.